As I told you, over the years I submitted a lot of grant applications and I got some. And then I, t in 2012, I really got lucky. I got a grant that I didn't even apply for. And uh, it's called, in English, the Spinoza Prize. And it is a grant uh, that there are five of these every year in the Netherlands. And uh, that, was uh, that, that was really a, a smashing gift. It, it can only be granted to people who have university jobs. So I just had my university job for two years. So uh, I was grateful I had that. And I was also grateful to others who submitted my case to, to the jury, no doubt a, lo a lot of work. Uh, and the wonderful thing for me for that money is that uh, I can stay a researcher in this whole, how do I spread my time? It's the case in, in my uh, department and, and in the faculty that uh, we have to, for if, if you have a job, you spend 60% of your time on teaching. And uh, in practice, that tends to grow. And, and I admire my colleagues who, who can do that. My energy is very low. If I would do that, I would be so depleted, I would not be able to do uh, to re research. So with this grant, a part of what I do is pay part of my own salary so that I can do 20% teaching, because I like the teaching, it's, it's, in, it's important to do. Um, but I can ho go on being an, a, a researcher uh, in a way that, uh, that makes sense to me. That also, a few years after that, uh, I got that grant. Uh, the ch my children were adults by this time. Uh, their father and I had grown into completely different lives, so we had achieved our, our task of bringing up the children in a, in, a, in a companionable way, but we each got our own way. Uh, we separated, so I came to live in Amsterdam in a, in a flat of my own, walking distance from the office, which is a great good, especially in uh, COVID times when we can't go to the office. But uh, the good thing th also in the last time of living in Amsterdam was that I can go for walks on the edges of town with colleagues, with friends, with students. And, and that brings me on the topic of walking that I wanted to say a little bit about. Because one of the things I have been doing in Amsterdam that, that I'm actually glad to be able to tell is, is walking seminars. Uh, and a, a walking seminar is where you go with a group of people and uh, from Amsterdam it's easy we can take public transport and we either be in the dunes or in the polder and it's all flat so you can actually have a seminar you walk two by two and first let's say 15 20 minutes person A and person B jointly take care of the work of person A then I call out light uh, when I'm the walking seminar uh, sort of uh, leader whatever you want to call it uh, chair uh, I call out shifting care, and then they jointly take care of the work of person B. And, and then after, again, 20 uh, minutes or so, we call out shifting people. And then people shuffle around a bit, and they start, person A walks with person whatever, uh, P, Q, uh, Z. And, and you can do that, w we do that for 10, 12 kilometers, and you speak to four or five people in that way. And uh, oftentimes we would have a theme, uh, and it could be how to relate to the literature or what about the idea of the assemblage or what is a network or what it could be very content like or very process of the work or how do you stop uh, etc and so on so it would be thematic oriented and and the first walking seminar was just me and one student phd student Malini Sur I'm still grateful to her that she turned up and but after that we sometimes had 20 or uh, People and when we would have guests, we would do that too. Uh, the last, well, the last two years has been difficult with the pandemic because we couldn't go in public transport. Before that, I had troubles with my feet, so we had a little gap. 
but I hope to restart that. It's, it's really a very good way. I've also done a lot of supervisions, one-on-one, in, in walking mode, but I can recommend the walking seminar as a format. Uh, we have a blog. You can have all our questions. It's, uh, it's there for free. Um, so the walking seminar has, uh, uh, is something I, I love as a, as a format. Uh, by the way, I also, as a way of contributing to the community, uh, since I have this job, I, I will it's good to contribute something. I'm on the ethics board and uh, of the research school. So this is anthropology, sociology, political science, geography, uh, and what did I forget? I don't know, so I forgot something. Uh, political science, sociology, I don't know whether. Anyway, we have a research, an ethics board, where we try not to do the rule ethic thing of you have to do it in this way, but we take inspiration from care ethics. Mm -hmm. How are you caring for people? So not what is your informed consent form, but might it be a good idea actually? Maybe not, obviously. In many cases it isn't. People don't want to sign forms uh, with their names on it. So if you do anonymity, by all means, do something else, explain them. So, so what we have is a series of questions trying to challenge ourselves and our colleagues to consider, to think about the ethical dimensions about of the work and not a set of fixed rules. So we try to set that up to, to avoid getting, uh, what is it, uh, torn in, in a kind of ethics police while still uh, caring for, for uh, our collective efforts in doing good research or good, or good in a wider than a method sense. Now, against all this background, my current work has shifted to issues of valuing with the case of clean. Now, this, these issues of valuing build again, uh, again, it's things I have started to do as a student. I keep on doing things that I hope to do then, and then now I've, and then sometimes 10, sometimes 30 years later, 40 years, I can finally do them. And this is the one on normativities. When I started to do empirical philosophy, my philosophy friends would say, but where's the normative dimension? Because in their idea, you'd have empirical, and that's fact, and normative, that is that you stand outside and, and judge the facts. And that I never liked. And I partly never liked because I thought, who am I to judge the facts? And by the way, who's going to listen to me anyway? Uh, so what was really in that particular quest uh, revelation was the work of Boltanski and Thévenot in done in the 80s. Uh, as I said, we introduced that in the 90s, so I, I learned about it uh, relatively early. And uh, where they also refused to, pay the, the, to play the role of, the, of judging from the outside or of critiquing from the outside. And they started to empirically wonder how do people justify practices that they're part of. And they wrote the Economie de la Grandeur, uh, the about, uh, well, how you can translate that, orders of worth. So they, st they started to make this whole being normative something that is not necessarily the task of the scholar, but that is a practice people are always already engaged in. And, and we built a lot of that also in the work on care, where we didn't want, to, we didn't want to say what is good care, but we wondered what do the people in the care practices consider to be good and why and how does that clash. For instance, some of the great work of, of Jeanette Pauls was looking how nurses and care assistants would have different ideas about good care and how that could clash and, and what interferences emerged in practice. Now what is also really interesting in this same grain is work uh, of that is not on judging but on ap or justifying but on appreciation and I'm thinking Antoine Hagnon on appreciating music or Geneviève Tile on, on wine tasting where they show where they try to go away from the kind of uh, Bourdieu type explanation from the outside if people like something it is to show off but they tr well, Bourdieu is a bit more complicated but just to, to be quick but what they try to show is the effort that goes into appreciation what, what kind of practice that is. And we had come across that also in the work on food and eating, where uh, trying appreciating food is not going all by itself. Uh, the work on enjoy your food shows how difficult it is, can be under practical, and anyway, how much practice work goes into it. 
in that same uh, quarter, I had worked with a, a good sociology student on good tomatoes. Frank Huitz is his name. He had done interviews with what we called tomato experts. And these were all kind of people. They were uh, growers, but people working in retail, but also cooks and eaters. There weren't many interviews, but they were really rich. And what we disentangled from them is uh, what you could call orders of worth of the tomato. Uh, so they're different from, from the justification orders. So repertoires of valuing, uh, cost, practicalities, aesthetics, looks, and, and we showed they're not so neatly separated and how they interfere in one another. But what the step we thought we were adding to this was that if if you're relating to tomatoes, you don't have your hands on your back just appreciating them as, as the classical person, uh, as the person listening to classical music in their room, for instance, listening to other people making classical music. Somebody who uh, relates to tomatoes is always already caring for them. So people put on some basil or they put on pepper to make the tomato good, or they grow it in this or that soil to make it good. So we thought if you have valuing, it's not just about appreciating or judging, it's also about improving. But the fun thing with food and with eating is that you end by eating the tomato. So thereby you really value it as edible, but you make it unedible, you devalue it. So what we try to bring in is these really material processes of valuing. And another sideline of that is, is a smaller thing I did on nature. Uh, where also the question is, how do you value nature? And this was a talk and also a paper I did asked by a Dutch policy, uh, uh, what is it, a research for policy uh, a group, who asked, that was quite funny actually, who had to write re European reports and they asked four European philosophers. So they, ha they had these three big men and me. Uh, so I was suddenly the Dutch philosopher. This was sort of fun because I was already for a long time in an anthropology department, but I was pleased to be a Dutch philosopher then. So my contribution there was first, one of them was to say, European nature, where is that? Uh, because it's not within the boundaries of Europe. And if Europeans eat pigs, their nature is also in the Amazon. Uh, and, and we really have to be careful if we do any kind of policy that we uh, related to nature, that we realize that, I mean, this was of course building on the long idea of spatial metaphors, but here also spatial realities, the whole idea of how, how in eating the globe is being folded and how uh, s nutrients are being carried around. Uh, and like also the fish for the omega-3 and like the bananas, that w et cetera and so on. Uh, and <coughs> my other intervention there was to <coughs> sorry <coughs> to bring out how uh, nature is at how there are clashes between different repertoires of understanding nature. This is again the mantra of the differences. But what was interesting here was to see how there is this big clash between, on the one hand, a sort of I evolutionary theory idea of individual uh, individuals that are part of their genealogy uh, and that relate in this gene genealogical way uh, where you have the ancestors and the offspring and on the other hand you have the har what is far more prominent in eating is a more ecological idea of nature where what you relate to is not that your ancestors but your food mm. or your prey or, or uh, so your, your food your prey or your predators uh, and the ones you, who eat you. So where relating is is set up in a, in a different way, which also means a different type of idea of what it is to care for nature, uh, whether you care for individuals in a genealogy or for uh, relations, where you have often these concrete tensions, whether a certain species in a nature reserve should be killed or not, where those who are individualizing animals as if they're sort of quasi-humans that need to be individualized, which is itself sometimes questionable, but another story, where they want to save this horse rather than the ecosystem. Good. Now, the current work I'm doing, building on all this idea of, of normativities in practice, um, is I, I, I'm 
I haven't finished the other book, but it always happens in that the other book gets delayed because the new project starts. Everybody has their own version of this, I guess. So the current project um, is on clean and cleaning. And in a, in a lot of social science, clean is a sort of bad guy because that's what we're normalized to be, uh, or something like that. And it's, uh, but since I don't particularly start with people, uh, but with practices, uh, cleaning practices, why, why would they be negative? Uh, it, uh, it's not necessarily a good idea if we make a mess of things. And we did one project in, uh, with wastewater treatment system, where actually it was a collaboration between uh, postdocs here and natural scientists from elsewhere about building an algae-based wastewater treatment system. And what is it? What kinds of cleans are implied there? But and what I'm now involved in, with a great postdoc, Mandy de Wilde, is that we're jointly working on clean in the urban spaces of Amsterdam. And this is partly collaborative with the municipality. That's concerned about well, you can keep cleaning the city, but how to keep it clean? How to prevent the moment that cleaning would be needed? And what Mandy and I are trying to do is shift away there from this idea that the people are being are to be blamed so to from a kind of moralizing idea of people throwing things away, and instead have this idea about how practices and infrastructures do not meet, and this is partly to do with let's say selling lots of food in the disposable uh, packaging, and then uh, of course there's soon not enough space for that to throw that away or and what and this whole idea of differences is also still present so one of the things we were immediately disconcerted with when the pandemic the uh, covid pandemic started is this enormous attention for hygienic clean for preventing the traveling of virus and this complete lack of attention for pollution and for ecological clean uh, for poison clean so we had immediate photos as had by the way fairly quickly other people all over of thrown away face masks thrown away gloves in the beginning and and the, the, the globally the numbers are are daunting of of the amount of pollution and i think this is for healthcare by the way going to be a lot it's a, it's a lot more structural problem that Sometimes it's cheaper to buy new instruments than to sterilize them, and uh, the amount of mess is being made. Now, clean is not a cheerful topic, uh, let me tell you. The, the amount of pollution, uh, the plastic pollution in the oceans, the, uh, uh, the well, uh, etc., and so on, I mean, you can read about that in a newspaper, is, is really uh, everywhere. But Intellectually, it is at the same time a fascinating case. And it also teaches us a lot about, about modes of valuing so, and ways of valuing. So Mandy and I are drafting a book actually in Dutch again to, to shift languages again and to play with that. W we will uh, have it translated and or translated ourselves afterwards into English. Um, but um, uh, we can do all kind of theoretical things that we want to do with materials uh, from cleaning in Amsterdam. And of course, I hope to also do a parallel one uh, and, and edit it with, uh, to, to counter my own provincialism uh, that I think I, I'm not excusing myself for the provincial. I think it's good. I think the, the West ought needs to be studied. Mm -hmm. But it's also good to at the same time then have to not get caught in it. And to again have, like with the on other terms, have a dialogue with other people doing studies in other places where the stakes of clean are are very different. Say my colleague Anita Hardon will want to write an article about the Philippines, where for people all kind of things get uh, in very sm done in small packages, but then you have these endless amounts of packages. Uh, so clean all over the globe is is going to amuse us for. A while for a while intellectually so and at the same time disconcerted socially and but we hope that of course having the intellectual practice uh, tension there may be a small kind of contribution and that is also something i i can end on uh, as this was struggle in theory uh, everything i've been doing so far and i'm still doing 
the hope was also all along that it would be a great social contribution. I'm not too optimistic about that, uh, given uh, where, how to say that, wha how all kind of practices that I tried to cont interfere in went exactly the other, uh, the other way than what I, what I would have hoped. Choices everywhere, uh, accounting systems are everywhere. So uh, I'm also not thinking that either eating or cleaning that my work will practically interfere with that. The consolation is that at least uh, other people seem to read it and, and take things away from that. So I'm, and by being super grateful that I also think taxpayers have paid for my salary all along. Uh, and somehow so far there has been this societal space for some of us, and I, lucky me, to do this kind of intellectual work. What I'm concerned with is I really hope that for the next generation that kind of space remains and, and that the uh, university will prove to be sturdy enough as an institution, that it will allow people to do sharp intellectual work that engages with the present. And thank you for listening to me. Thank you.